Dear Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the opportunity that we have to come and worship together. Not just because we are talking about the word of God, because we are also strengthening one another and we are fellowshipping together and building relationships. Father, I pray for your divine presence here. And I want to pray, Lord, that you would speak through me this morning. Help me to say the words that you want me to say. That the Spirit inspire me. And so forgive me of anything on my heart, Lord, that would prevent that. I want to pray that each one of us here would hear the message we need. And not necessarily what I say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As you know, or last time I was here, I told you I've been reading through the book of Deuteronomy. And I finished it up actually last night. I got to figure out how, why it's not, hold on, there we go, <clears throat> and so there was an interesting section um, in Deuteronomy, and I want to share with you today, it was about the kings, it talks about a king, the important thing is, is that when Israel was on the borders of the promised land, and God was <clears throat> excuse me, leading them, um, who, what was the plan for the king of Israel? What was the, the pl- God's plan, original plan? Who? That's right. God would be their king. They would not have an earthly king. It was God's purpose that he would always rule and that they could always go to the temple and inquire for the will of God through the Urim and the Thummim or through the prophets. And and so in Deuteronomy chapter 28, they are meeting together and they're on two mountains. There's Mount Gerzim and Mount Ebal. And they gathered on the two mountains and they talked about, and then Moses on one mountain, they proclaimed the blessings of God if they would be faithful, and on the other, the curses if they were unfaithful, right? And so in Deuteronomy chapter 28, 1, 2, and verse 10, it says, Now it shall come to pass that if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God and observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord, your God. Then all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of you. So here's a blessing, right? If you keep the commandments of God, if you're following his statutes and his um, principles, Sorry. And then there was the repeating of um, curses. I don't know why that's up. We shouldn't. Wait a minute. I, I'll get rid of that. I think I know how to get rid of that. Is that better? <laughs> A lot better. Sorry, I should have saw that. And so in Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy 28, 15, it says, But it shall come to pass that if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. So a lot of times I hear people say, Well, no matter, you know, whoever's elected, whatever happens, it all, it's all God's will. Right, But when you read this, do people have a choice in the outcome of their lives, or is everything God's will? People have a choice, right? Now, when you read and study the Bible, you realize that ultimately God will work through the faithful to bring about salvation and to bring about the salvation at the end of time. But how we get there has a large part of it has to do with us, with our choices. 
and um, nations, not just Israel, but in Jeremiah, it says that if any nation is humble before God and serves the Lord, he will bless that nation. And so it's with every nation that way, and you can look at our nation today and judge where we are with our nation and in history. But I want to talk to you about something a little more interesting, and this has a lot to do with what we're talking about today. And Deuteronomy chapter 17, which I want us to turn to, I'd like to read what it says there. Excuse me. And it's interesting that it talks about a king that is not, thank you. It's talking about a king in verse 14 of chapter 17. And it says, and when you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and you and possesses it and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. So Moses is telling them that it's been revealed to him that they will want a what? An earthly king, right? Then he says, you shall surely set a king over you whom, what? I ch- that you choose? What does it say? You will set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren, you shall set a king over you. And you may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart be turned away. Nor shall he greatly multiply silver or gold for himself. Also it shall be that when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, and then he shall write for himself a copy of the law in in a book from the one before the priests and the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and to be careful to observe all the words of the law in these statutes. That his heart may not be lifted up above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from uh, from the commandment to the right or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Now it's interesting to note, it says that you will choose a king. You will want a king. But God gives guidelines and says when it comes to this point, I will choose the king. And these are some of the things that he must be careful to do or careful not to do and then what he should do, which is keep the law close to his heart, right? So let's look at these things. One, You shall want to choose a king. But he says, I shall choose. And he must be from your brethren. And that's kind of important. You know, one of the things we look in the New Testament, when Jesus was born, Herod was worried about his throne. He was a tyrant. He was worried. He even killed members of his own family. But one of the reasons he was fearful of the throne is because he knew he wasn't a descendant. He wasn't an Israelite. He was an Edomite. And he was ruling over Israel. And so his throne was in jeopardy. And it says, you shall not multiply horses. You shall not go back toward Egypt. You know, when you think about Egypt, Egypt had influenced Israel in a very negative way, right? Because remember, what what did they build that was similar to what they had seen in Egypt? 
The golden calf, right? Egypt had been a problem, a thorn in their flesh for a long time. And he says, you are not to go back that way. He said, you shall not multiply wives for yourselves. Why? Because it's, he says, they will turn your heart away. They will turn your heart. He said, you shall not multiply silver or gold as well. And we're going to look at these a little more care, uh, closely. But he also said that you shall keep a copy of the law with him and read it. Why? So that you fear the Lord and be careful that his heart might not be lifted up and that you, sh that you may turn, that you may not, it should say, turn aside from the right hand or to the left. So basically to read the law and to live by it or live by faith, right? To follow the law by faith in the God of heaven and to trust in the word of God, its principles, that our hearts or his heart might not be lifted up or turned away. Now, these things are very important, and here is an interesting setup. I just put it in a um, structural column there, but I show what is interesting is that this is developed into a chiasm. On the bookends, you realize what a chiasm, it means it comes to a, a point or a main point or a head, and then it goes, things are reversed. <clears throat> and you'll find on the bookends are the two key aspects for salvation. One, it's the king, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. The king from rejection to salvation. On the other bookend is the law, which is for safety of the, of the believer. And in the middle, there are things that we need to be careful of because they can lead us into losing our salvation and actually lead others into losing salvation. And it's actually, the, even though these are developed for the king, or God gave the king these instructions, and, it, and it's quite um, because the king has the power over all the people in his realm, because the life of an individual can hang on the very word of the king, just one word. Because his word is decree and law, God specifically gives them these instructions. So if they are important for the king, they're also important for us. And um, maybe we, don't, we can't have someone executed at our command, but our lives are at stake. And our very life is at stake today in the decisions that we make and what we do. <clears throat> Um, the Lord is coming and our choices whether we study the word of God or what as Christians the king was a believer or he was supposed to be and these are instructions for the believers right and if we ignore them they could lead to our destruction so I'd like to talk about them a little bit so at first I want to talk about the, the things in the middle the military, the horses, the wives, and the silver and the gold. In the Bible, horses, now they understood what this meant, but maybe you don't, so I want to review it. Horses meant military strength, right? It meant that you had an army, and horses and chariots were your strength and power. They were, you had your foot soldiers, and then the step up was the horses. Maybe not quite like a tank, the, the ancient tanks were the elephants, right? But they were the next best thing. And the more horses and chariots had, the more powerful your military was. And the silver and the gold. Now I want to go back, hold on. I, what I want to do here is to also, as we're talking about that, I want to talk about Solomon. Solomon was the son of David who took the throne in Jerusalem. And his responsibility was to build the temple and lead the people. And when he took the throne, he was a humble 
young man, and he loved the Lord, and he didn't feel qualified in the undertaking that he had. And he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord came and spoke to him and gave him the opportunity. He said, whatever you asked, I will do for you. And so Solomon asked for what? He asked for wisdom. He, and God said, since you did not ask for wealth or power or whatever else, but you asked for wisdom, you will not only have wisdom, but you will also have wealth. Not necessarily that the Lord would give it to him per se, but because of the wisdom, he would receive wealth, right? And you see that in Solomon's life. You made wide choices and he got wealth. So what did he do with the horses? Now this is interesting because as Solomon used his wisdom and as his popularity grew, it's in 1 Kings chapter 426 and Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. And so why would God say, don't heap up horses? Don't create yourself a massive military force. <clears throat> because their trust is to be in who? God. Horses, the military strength, mean power. And when you have a strong military, do you trust in God or do you trust in your own strength? See, this is the tendency for, would be a tendency for the king to once he was powerful, to start trusting in his own abilities and not trust wholly on the Lord. Right? It said, do not heap up silver or gold or wealth. Well, that also is power, right? The more wealth, the more um, gold and silver a king would have, the more influence he would have, not only over his own nation, but the other nations. He could even buy himself an army. And it says of Solomon here, it says, now the weight of the gold that came into Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold, about approximately a billion dollars a year. Besides that, he had the merchantmen and the traffic of the spice merchants and the kings of Arabia who paid tribute and of the, gover and of the governors of the country who also paid tribute right? And the king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones. So Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. And at that time, with you realize the population and the influence, that is exceedingly wealthy. To have silver like stones, if someone dropped it, they wouldn't bother to bend down to pick it up. Was he at this time, and, and the point was, was this necessary? Was this necessary? First Kings, when Solomon dies and his, son's son, uh, his son came to take the throne, and Israel, the tribes, came to anoint his son as king, they made a request. And it says after, it says uh, when Rehoboam came to Shechem and to, for the inauguration, they spoke to him he, and they said, your father make our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke which he puts on us and we will serve you. So was what Solomon doing, was that necessary? No. He was out of line. And he was trusting in the strength, his own military strength. He started trusting in his wealth, and it became a problem. But what about wives? If he was ignoring the word of the Lord here, what about wives? In 1 Kings 11, 1 through 3, it said, But Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter's daughter of Pharaoh, the women of the Moabites, the Amorites, the Edomites, the Sidonians, and the Hittites, from all the nations whom the Lord said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you, for surely they will turn you away your, away your hearts after their gods. Now what text is he quoting there? 
It is Deuteronomy chapter 17, which we just read, right? They will turn your heart after other gods. And Solomon clung to these in love. Now, what kind of, can you love? Well, it says here, can you love 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines? No. Not true love. It's lust. Right? He lusted. It's not true love. And Solomon's heart was lifted up, or away from God. And it says in Kings chapter 11, 3 uh, and 4, and verse 10, it says, And his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass that when Solomon was old, that his wives turned his heart after other gods. And so God said, I will surely rent the kingdom from thee, and I will give it to thy servant. So, and that is what happened because we remember we read about Rehoboam and son. Um, at that time, and I don't, and that's not the story, but 10 of the tribes, because he would not relent and be more merciful, 10 of the tribes tore away and started the northern kingdom, which we read about. And so, Solomon, just Solomon's actions alone tore the kingdom in half, or more than half, tore ten away from him. Yet God was still going to work his purpose. And he did. Remember John chapter 2, 15 and 16 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is what? Not in him, Right? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. And that's what we see in this instruction, right? Do not heap up the treasure, the wealth, the military strength. And this was for kings, but the principles still lie for us today. What is it in our lives It's not saying that you don't have a military or that you don't have some wealth or that you don't marry a a, a woman and have a wife. But they're principles that you should follow, right? Don't let your heart be taken by lust, greed, or power. Whatever it is in your life that has a hold on you. Now most of you, if you're seeking the Lord, and this is what we'll talk about in a little bit, if you're reading His Word, you're studying the Bible, you're seeking God's instruction and trying to live by faith, God will put in your heart what is the infection in your life. Right? These kings and us as well should always be careful not to let that which attracts us pull us into the abyss. And it did that for Solomon. Unfortunately, he did turn around. He turned it back around. But the damage he done to, that he did to Israel was ir- irreparable. Or irreparable, I should say. In Samuel chapter 8, 7 through 9, <clears throat> it says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken. So we're going to talk about the king, the choosing of the king, going back to the beginning. As Christians, so our first thought as Christians, let us always examine and not let anything get out of control in our lives. We know the things that are pulling us into this world. 1 Samuel 8, 7 through 9 says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, the prophet, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For what did they do? They had requested a what? King, right? And so the Lord spoke, tell them to follow, give them what they want. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. This is a sorrowful thing about you follow the scriptures. There's always... The people that are supposed to be God's people are always rejecting him. 
And it says here, according to all the works which they had done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me, served other gods, so that they do also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, how be it yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king, that it shall reign over them. So he was warning him, and Solomon go, or Samuel goes back, and he warns him, they're going to take your daughters, they're going to take your wealth, they're going to take your land, they're going to lead your children into war. All of these warnings. But the main point here is the rejection of God as their king. And it always seems to be that way from the Garden of Eden, doesn't it? Our first parents rejected their king because they did not have faith to believe. They rejected God as their king in the, the earth. They, they rejected God as king when they were going through the wilderness when they built the golden calf and worshipped it. They rejected their king when they came to the borders of the promised land. And the ten spies talked against the word of the Lord. And they rebelled against God. And they rejected their king and gave a human king. In Luke chapter 1 verses 32 and 33 it says, And he shall be great. Who is it talking about? It's talking about Jesus, isn't it? This is talking about the birth of Jesus. He shall be great. He shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, what? David, right? He was going to ascend to the throne of David. That he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be, what? An end? No end. That's right. Jesus was going to be the king. So from the time, even though Israel rejected God as their king, God says, I will choose the king because this is a divine appointment. The kingdom is a, is a um, spiritual kingdom that all in the world who come to find refuge in the, in the holy kingdom of God will find peace and safety there. From the appointment of David, there was this promise that salvation would come through his lineage. The kingdom. A salvation, not just a blessing for Israel, but a blessing for the whole world, as he promised Abraham. So despite man's efforts and man's rejection, God was going to see through his promise of salvation. And it says here, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 11, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. Again, He had rejection from His own people. In every age, in every place, there's been rejection. If God says, keep the Sabbath holy, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, and you say, that don't matter, I'll make my own day. Is that acceptance or rejection? If we say, oh, well, I'm saved by grace so I can do what I want. Is that exception, accepting or rejecting God? In every age, there's been rejection. But God didn't leave it there. Because even though there was rejection, He had a plan for salvation, right? And so even in the beginning of in Eden, when our first parents rejected God as their king, the Lord promised that I'll bring salvation. In Genesis 3.15, God said to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, meaning between the church and seed of Satan or his followers. He, her seed, meaning Christ, he will bruise your head, the serpent's head, but you shall bruise his heel. 
So here is the promise at the very beginning. God is rejected, but despite the rejection, he, pro- he gives us the promise of salvation. That's hard to understand, but it's wonderful. In Acts chapter 130, it says, Therefore, being a prophet, talking about David, the first king, Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would rise up Christ to sit on his throne. So despite the rejection of Israel for of God being their king, God saw to it that there would be salvation. And in Revelation 7.14 It says, these shall make war against the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, and He is the Lord of lords, the King of kings, and they that are with Him are called the chosen and the faithful. So praise God that despite the rejection, He shall be King, and He shall bring salvation to all who believe. To you here today, only in that we trust in Him. In Philippians 4.16 it says, and I believe this is coming soon. It's coming soon. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air, and so it shall ever be with the Lord. It's not much more longer, right? I don't know if you know, and I was uh, I didn't print out the, the new stuff, but the House, the Michigan House, just passed the law. Now it goes to the Senate. But anyone who misuses someone's... Um, the, what do they call it? Pronouns. Do you know what a pronoun is? Some people don't even know what, the prono- what pronouns are yet. And if you misuse a pronoun, you can be, you can be uh, given a $5,000 penalty of, or up to five, five years in prison. That's past the House. It's going to go to the Senate, and I'm sure our governor will sign it if, if it goes that far, and it will. But the point is... Who would have thought of that five years ago, right? Things are coming. America is no longer that beacon of Christianity, the beacon of light. So what about the the law by faith, which was what the king was supposed to do? Make sure God has has given a warning on how he should behave, to guard himself. He's also provided a plan of salvation, which will happen. But how do we keep ourselves in safety to make sure that we take advantage of it? Well, it's the law. And it's the law by faith. Right? In fact, it says right in Revelation 12, 17 of God's faithful at the end of time, it says, and the dragon was wroth, or the devil was wroth with the woman, the church, and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And then Revelation 12, 14, 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Now, this has been a constant theme right from Genesis, right? There has been the theme of having faith in the word of God in the principles of his kingdom and to follow it by faith. Whether you were Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and it followed through to the New Testament, and it's followed through right to the end of time, They keep the commandments of God, the testimony of Jesus, and faith in Jesus. There is that trust. If we cling to the safety net that God has provided, then salvation which he has provided will be ours to obtain. 
And so that is the closing as I close today. There's three points, right? Guard yourself. Trust in the process of salvation. Despite what it looks like in the world, despite the rebellion going on in our society, Christ will obtain our salvation. That was Paul's message to the Ephesians, right? He says, I know there will be ravenous wolves when I am removed out of the way that is coming. Trust what you were taught. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and your salvation is secure. And the third is keep the law, have faith, trust in God, what he has provided. And um, we have that promise moving forward.